My name is Gail Mooney and I'm a member of the Bowery Gallery and I'm one of the artists participating in this evening's discussion. While I know we are all looking forward to gathering a person again, one of the advantages of this type of virtual uh, gathering is that it allows people who are not in the New York area to join us. So welcome to those of you who are joining us from out of town, as well as those of you in the New York vicinity. Both the exhibition, as well as uh, this evening's panel, explore the meaning of the creative process. Process typically refers to the materials, mediums, methods, and techniques that an artist employs in picture making. However, tracing as it does the artist's journey from a work's initial inception to its finish, process reflects every thought, feeling, sensation, and sensation that goes into making a work of art. As such, we would like to suggest that process itself embodies meaning. Through this show and this evening's panel discussion, we wish to invite the viewer to delve beneath surface appearances to reflect on the multiple meanings of the process of discovery that marks the artist's journey toward, as Matisse put it, that condensation of sensations which constitutes a picture. Tonight you will be hearing from five of the 11 artists in the show, K Kamini Avril, Tony Serio, Rachel Saporin, Greer Torrance, and myself. After each of the five artists has presented, there will be a time set aside for you to ask questions. We look forward to hearing from you and hope that this evening's presentation will generate a lively discussion on the theme of tonight's talk and the works that you will be seeing. You should feel free to put your questions in the chat box at any time. Alternatively, you can wait and pose your question later by raising your hand during that portion of the program. The 11 artists in this exhibition represent a wide range of themes, motifs, and approaches to picture making. Yet we would all agree that our process engages us in an open-ended process of discovery that often yields unexpected and surprising results. So by way of introduction, I wanna begin by saying just a few brief words about the six artists who are featured in the exhibition along with us, but who are not participating in this evening's panel. So this slide you are seeing now is um, two works by Deborah Kahn. Deborah Kahn describes her process as one through which she continually draws and weaves color planes across the canvas. Through this process, figures begin to emerge and coalesce into groups of figures that inhabit a believable world such that, as Kahn puts it, the fiction suddenly becomes real. Next slide, please. Jeremy Long is interested in the intersection of different spatial worlds. He values thoughtfulness over excitement and poetic meaning over novelty. In the image on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the right entitled family group number three, the two figures in the foreground as opposed to the one seen through the door, doorway in the background seem to occupy the same space, yet they seem worlds apart, each lost in his own thoughts. In the painting on the left entitled Emerson Study, the angularity of the composition, how the figure's left arm echoes that of the triangle behind his head, for example, seems to amplify his state of mind. Those of you familiar, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Those of you familiar with uh, Lynn Catula's work associate her primarily with her still lifes, serene and quiet distillations of color and light typically done in oil. In these drawings of her cat, the artist says that <clears throat> working with ink, which does not permit for erasure, more fully <clears throat> allowed, her to, allowed her to work with greater spontaneity, permitting her to enter more fully into the experience of her cats, who she discovered are in a state of perpetual motion. The drawing on the right captures the shifting positions of the, ar of the artist's kitty, while the cat in the drawing on the left would appear to be at rest, the drawing captures its quivering state of restlessness. And just to let everyone know, Lynn's Catula's work will soon be featured in a one person show on the Bowery Gallery website. So please keep your eyes out for that. Next slide, please. 
These two paintings by Mark Lewis are part of a series he, uh, he refers to as street fiction pieces through which, <clears throat> excuse me, through which he uh, endeavors to capture the mystery of the human experience revealed in paint, surface, subject, form, light, space, and color. These paintings reveal the artist's keen observation of his surroundings, as well as the state of mind provoked by these street scenes. Next slide, please. In these two paintings by Young Hee Chow Martin, uh, these are based on the myth Orstia from the Aeschylean tri trilogy. Martin describes her process as one of constant revisions and searching for forms that feel right. Through the various layers of paint, the narrative of this myth requires nuance, depth, and meaning. The alternating color schemes of the two paintings reverberate with different feeling. Next slide, please. Naomi Nepsau characterized her process as one of seeking relations of color and line that carry meaning. Her three studies in the exhibition after Bellini's St. Francis in Ecstasy two of which are represented here, reveal this evolution as Nepsau moves from, from, an understanding, from understanding the painting's underlying structure and color palette, culminating in the luminous collage on the right, which represents the outpouring of awe, wonder, and grandeur that was the culmination of the saint's life of holiness. I would now like to introduce our first panelist, Tony Serio. Thank you, Gail. Um, you can hear me, right? <laughs> that's, okay. that's not. <laughs> I'm Tony Serio, and thanks for joining us uh, for our talk today. I'm going to take you through my process as related to four landscape paintings. The first one is called Summer. When I first moved to Washington Heights, I would come down to the riverside and see all the people from our community who on the summer weekends would hold their gatherings there. And I felt compelled to work in a series of paintings that celebrate that activity. My goal was to weave their narratives into my compositions with a mix of on-site and reflective studio work to distill my fleeting observations and capture the transient energy of these events. In this fall work, I find ways to state the figure simply in paint, using the palette knife to integrate them into the landscape space, a painting language that I would use in the larger work. Next. Here's a gouache painting of the general area of the work. Sometimes I like to do quick paintings to get my hand in motion and take color notes. Um, I'm playing around here with placement and possible activities that I observe or imagine. There's a figure under the tree on the right, and that will be the focus of my next image. So next. Okay, this is an oil, oil study. Here's a figure sitting on the bench in the shadow under the tree. The area is emptied out of people as I concentrate on how the light hits parts of the ground and the, tree, the trunk of the tree. It was important to me that I focus on getting the feeling for the tonality and color of the shadowy area that I would later populate with activity. This is actually painted as I was working on the uh, larger final version. Next. Okay, now this, this panel was painted on site and fairly accurate depicting the groups that were there that day. It has a longer horizontal proportions, which doesn't reflect the final size of the, of the uh, larger canvas that I'll show you next. You'll notice that white tent from the first um, slide is, um, is, is pushed back in space. So here I'm going for this long spatial gesture that as we follow the path through the park, I felt the overall light and time of day was captured in this little work and maybe superior to my more final, my final, more ambitious effort. Next. Okay, and there's a painting that I call Summer. It's 26 by 48. Um, it's fleshed out with 
lots of figures and activities. I used sketches from my figure drawing classes and I made up figures in motion. I wanted to get the contrast between movement and stasis from the couple totally relaxed, lying on the ground to the people bicycling and running through the park. The man with his back to us could be an unconscious projection of myself, uh, the artist slash viewer, where many events pinwheel around him unfolding in time as we scan the image. Next. Okay, this is a, my next theme that I call trees on an embankment. Um, and just want to note here at the end of painting, a painting session, or even as I'm heading towards the destination to paint, I always take note of areas that I pass and find new subjects this way. And then this is part of my process. In this case, I turn from the direction I have been painting to see this grouping of trees on the embankment. And here, I've gotten away from the noisy crowd I had immersed myself in earlier. This watercolor from early spring that year was my first attempt at the subject. The trees were still mostly bare, but new green was coming in. I had been to the Prado Museum in Spain in recent years and was very taken by the old master's use of tonality and use of color of black as a color. Adding black to my palette was a way of extending the tonal depth of my work. The landscapes of those old masters always fascinated me. So here I'm focusing entirely on nature to develop that aspect of my landscapes. Next. Okay, so the season moved on to early summer. The ground covering came in as, as did the leaves on the trees. Pencil drawing on the left and on the right, watercolor wash painting, both concentrate on how those trunks of trees twist together and explode outward. Fragonard and Claude Lorraine are two artists that come to mind here, especially their drawings. Um, I'm, here, I'm, I want to, I'm, I'm working on um, how to get the weighty tonal dark masses to hold their place against the lyrical movements of the tree limbs. Next. And here's oil painting that resulted from all the previous watercolors and drawings, which amounted to a rehearsal for this painting. That day, my hand was ready to follow through and respond to what I was seeing. The use of black mixed or otherwise applied straight, drawing with the brush added a punch that I was looking for. I, don't, I didn't think I was finished after my session was up for the day, but it turned out to be a one afternoon painting. The statement was there and for me, it held up the next day. Next. Okay, this is um, my next theme, summer park landscape. Here, I'm back in a more populated area, though not as busy as the first one. The background of tall trees drew me in and how they enclosed the area, creating this more personal space. The figures in this scenario will become critical in defining space and with their gestures and placement. Next. Um, these watercolors explore the left and right sides of the final composition. The light hitting the trees, contrasting with the luminous greens further back in the tree masses um, is something I explored in these. I try to keep that luminosity in the, lar in the larger painting. And I also did many more smaller paintings in addition to, to this, uh, what I'm showing here. Next. Okay, and this is the summer park landscape. It's oil on linen, uh, 26 inches by 32 inches. Um, I didn't work directly from drawings of watercolors, though I had them in mind as, as I was painting this one on location. My approach was to draw with the brush revising as I go. This went on for a while as I developed a space with the dark greens punctuated with warmer tints of greens that recede. I like taking the color and drawing with it and to see how I could work it, you know, throughout the painting. In this case, it, it was that purple color of the shadows that I brought up into the tree trunks. I fine tuned each tree trunk slightly, you know, to get differentiation, but the basic color unified the composition. I added the um, figures as I saw them and also worked from drawings that I had in a small sketchbook. The distant figure pushing a cart aligns with a tree's dress gesture and becomes a pivotal point, giving scale to the composition 
um, very much like a device Kuro would employ. Next. And here's my last theme. Um, and uh, I call this hibiscus split tree and highway. I was walking in an area that, I, and I don't usually stop by, you know, but I was really stopped in my tracks by this attractive blooming hibiscus bush. And stopping to look more closely and, you know, thinking about this as a subject, I noticed the broken tree beside it and then the highway beyond, realizing that I have to have all of the, three in this, the image that I was about to, um, about to work on. So working with the spatial triad, I started with watercolor, going for the luminosity and transparency of that meeting. My approach was um, about drawing and with a mark making attitude. Next. Um, then I went to gouache for my next pass at this motif working opaquely with broken brush strokes and with the color tuned way up. You know, um, it's, wash is intended to be applied in flat areas. And, but the way I like to use it, um, I would like to use it the way I use my oil paints with a certain kind of physicality. The rough watercolor paper helps, you know, to keep my brush strokes open. And the fact that it dries fast allows you to work over the colors quickly. However, I wasn't completely dissatisfied with this approach or with the color range, but it gave me a feel for how I wanted to travel through these trees into that obscured area beyond the dense mass of foliage. Next. Okay, so this is um, the oil painting version of, the, of this subject. Uh, so as this painting developed, it went to a darker tonality. And going for the weightiness of the masses of leaves that I, that I admire of the old master paintings. However, I, I, def, I defined the, the uh, movement of spatial planes with a palette knife in a more modernist um, language. Um, after a step back, I thought, uh, and I thought of Pizarro's earlier work, which I always felt akin to. One of my main interests in this painting is the patch of light in the foreground, uh, which travels behind the hibiscus hedge and is seen emerging above the hedge in a burst of light on the tree in the background. The, the highway is also more visible here and firmly planted behind the barrier of foliage, making it uh, another visual leaf for us to explore that space. So this was my moment of discovery in, in this work. And that's my talk, and I'm going to turn it over to Greer Torrance. Thank you, Tony. I'm very uh, honored to be sandwiched or nestled in between Tony Syria and Rachel Saporin. Uh, I've known both of them since 1978, and I think in some ways I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, and that is part of what I think of as process. Um, relationships, uh, the kind of empathy and inspiration that, that other people, other artists uh, provide that we share in uh, means a lot to me. And, and literally process does mean to, to go forward. And, um, and that kind of uh, dynamic helps us move forward, I believe. And I also wanted to mention the, the thought about discovery that um, uh, sometimes things are just just there in an artwork and we we discover them as, as gifts that, that exist um, to be uncovered. This is a little landscape uh, I did uh, last spring during the start of the pandemic when I was often riding my bike along this path near the Farmington River. It's uh, acrylic on um, wood, and it started to rain when I was painting this, and uh, the, the paint became very wet, and I thought, that's wonderful. And ever since then, I've been carrying a little uh, spray bottle when I go out to paint with acrylics. This is the place where I painted that painting, on the photograph on the left, and on the right is a little quick sketch of, of my father and myself. Um, standing in a field and he wrote a poem about just listening. 
being present in nature and, and hearing the sounds and the energies around you in the field. So the three um, paintings in the show are, are these. Um, this is a painting called Awards, and it is uh, fairly large. Those are pretty much life-size uh, people in the picture. On the right is an in-process view of the painting. So you can see as it progressed uh, to the left version, I painted out um, myself, the guy with the tie there, and another figure, two other figures, and became more interested in, in the, uh, the figure on the horse in the distance. This is a close-up of that painting just to give you a sense of the, the surface, the paint. And this is a painting called The Day the World Gets Round. And on the right is the preliminary or the in-process version um, showing how uh, I'm just sort of drawing it in with my paintbrush and building from piece to piece. Um, and you can also see that I cut the painting down uh, uh, eventually. The uh, square format worked better for, for my idea. So that's 54 by 54 inches oil on linen. That's a close up just again to show you the, the surface quality. And this is a painting called um, The Cup That I Drink. And on the right is the final version. On the left, it's still populated with characters who needed to um, be uh, taken out in order for the the light really to be uh, central in the in the final painting. Um, so so uh, you can see um, how I edited down the, the draft as it were. And often these narrative paintings have that kind of process going on, a sort of uh, dis distillation or less is more quality. This again is a is a detail of that painting. And this is uh, a little uh, page from my journal. And I put this up only to, to share with you that uh, my daily entrance, entrance, entries in my journal are a big part of my process. And on the right is a, is a painting of a house um, done sort of in the spirit of, of Van Gogh's uh, painting of Daubigny's garden. So this is a, a place uh, inhabited by someone I admire and look up to, sort of mentor artist. And the yin of my yang is landscape painting. So I, I continue to go back and look at nature, paint directly en plein air. And so this is a painting of Hartford, um, Connecticut. You see on the left, uh, a drawing in charcoal that's the same size as the final painting. It's around 26 inches uh, wide. And it becomes wider in the drawing. You can see how I added a little piece of paper on, on to uh, expand the composition. And there's a little detail showing the surface quality of that painting. And again, uh, a drawing leading to a painting. This is uh, New Britain, Connecticut, a little charcoal on the left. Not that little, it's about 24 inches wide. And then the painting on the right. And this is uh, a little acrylic on linen of uh, Plainville, Connecticut, where I where I now live. And you can see the the change from the charcoal drawing to the um, to the painting. And I'd like to end on a little nod to Matisse, who does such wonderful things uh, as he progresses. Uh, at the top left panel shows the first inception and this reads sort of as a comic book. You go to the next one on the right and so on until you get to the lower right to see the final version, which is so wonderfully resolved in terms of positive negative shape and pattern and the, uh, the gesture of each figure, especially the, the woman's head on the left, really nicely resolved. And with that, I would like to pass this along to my friend, Rachel Saporin. Um, 
Uh, greetings. It's been a pleasure to participate in the process of discovery show, um, but also to be on the panel and to really connect with uh, the other panelists process, um, which sometimes really overlaps mine and is sometimes quite different. But it's been um, a wonderful thing to share with um, my Bowery Gallery um, friends. Um, and um, listening to Greer and Tony, um, I, in Tony's work, I just um, was very intrigued with uh, his use of paths in the work and the earlier uh, work that had kind of an eye level path moving back. And then the later work where it's so lush, but you're let in, but you can't go any further. I just found those paintings very um, rich. And in Greer's work, because I am a narrative artist, I really uh, understood how he, in trying to tap into the narrative, would remove figures, add them, move them around. I, I really um, understood that. Um, in participating in process of discovery, I chose to show work that was very different from any process that I have um, used in my work in the past. And um, uh, usually my work um, connects more to what Greer and what Tony were talking about in terms of starting with the drawing and um, many revisions of a work. But in the dry points, um, I, it, there was a spontaneity, a spontaneity and immediacy and a no going back approach, which was very different for me. Um, I, uh, um, I started to do dry point. I really, I had been working on a series of etchings, um, but because of the pandemic, I could not uh, etch them at school like I usually do. I have a a Charles Brand Press in my studio that I print them on, but um, I, um, I I couldn't use hard ground and draw on it the way you would with an etching and then etch it in um, ferrochloric acid at school. Um, so I, since my work, my approach to printmaking is very much through drawing, I decided, oh, I think I'll try some some dry points and I've always admired the kind of richness of a dry point, the, the softness of um, that you can see um, in some of the marks, it's a kind of soft edge. Um, and at the same time, my dogs were very obliging and they became the perfect models. Uh, I would walk them across the street and they're very stick obsessed throw st the stick in the water and they would immediately, they're both border collars, they would immediately start to, um, to uh, play tug of war. And um, I uh, would bring my, um, uh, my iPhone with me and I would click um, some pictures um, to try to get the moment. Uh, next, please. Thanks. Um, so, it's kind of funny. I just started doing dry points and I was very intrigued um, as to when I would pull a print. And I think as a printmaker, there's always a sense of discovery in the process in that the work is reversed when you pull the print, when you run it through the press and you look at it. So there is always an element of surprise. Um, in this case, I was very surprised by the rich darks that that I saw and the very gestural quality that you could understand the movement of the dogs without knowing a lot of the specifics. Um, and um, at this point, I uh, dis as I prepared, I should say, as I prepared for um, the talk. Uh, for the panel, I decided maybe I should look up 
something about dry point. It's really kind of funny to do that at the end of the process. But I picked up my Gabor um, Petterty printmaking book, which is really the Bible of printmakers. And um, it was very interesting. I started reading about dry point and learning um, some interesting things about it. Um, Petterty talks about the fact that um, the best needle for, of the best point for your needle um, for doing a dry point is either sapphire or diamond. And of course I was using a very inexpensive um, etching needle. So um, that was very interesting. But the, 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 uh, what he spoke about that I found um, incredibly interesting and enlightening was that in, um, in dry point, what affects the uh, value of the line, the darkness of the line, the intensity of the line is the angle of the needle on the copper or whatever plate you're using. And if it's straight up a 90 degree angle, it will be a fine line. But if it's angled, let's say 30 degrees uh, to the plate, it gives you this kind of um, really dark edge. And uh, so that's what's happening here. I'm kind of glad that I did not know that I didn't read um, Petterdy's wise words um, before I did the prints because um, one of the things about the process of working on these is that um, I was so focused on seeing, not seeing the plate, but seeing the movement. And so I think that the gestural quality, the darkness of this print really happened in the process of seeing. Um, next, please. Um, these three dry points that I've started with um, are the earlier part of uh, the summer when I started working on these. And um, the, um, I, I focus more on what the dogs were doing than on the environment of the water. Um, and um, when seeing um, the beautiful um, ink drawings of, of Lynn Cotula's cats, I thought about her structural approach to understanding um, the cat, um, which I think is, is connected to my approach to drawing the dog and uh, in particular Jack's back to get the, the feeling of his movement. Um, next, please. Now this is an etching and I just wanted to mention that my early uh, connection to printmaking was as an undergraduate. Um, I was very fortunate to study um, with Michael Mazur who was a, a phenomenal printmaker. Um, and his whole approach to printmaking and uh, was that it was all about drawing and in, in particular about etching. And so in the dry points, but also in the, um, in the etchings, um, I feel that I really see it as an, as an extension of drawing. Um, this etching and um, the next etching, which I'll get to in a minute, um, show the quality of the line in etching, the cross hatching, the kind of Christmas. The thing about dry point is it's a very delicate medium, even though it's got this gutsy painterly vibe to it. Um, but of course, with etching, because um, the, um, the lines are etched into the plate, um, it has a lot of uh, longevity. You can, you can print it. Next, please. Um, before I began working on the dry points, I was working on a um, series of um, works, etchings, multiple plate etchings um, that were about the artists and the art community at Black Mountain College. And I focused on two, two figures in particular. Um, one of them was Elaine de Kooning and the other was Annie Albers. And the Albers came to Black Mountain College in Asheville, North Carolina 
um, at when Joseph Albers was asked to um, head up the school. And um, that was in the early 30s, around 1933, when they um, when the school began and the school went on um, into the late 50s. And um, it was amazing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, the history of Black Mountain College, but it was fascinating to know the artist who passed through Black Mountain College. Um, this, this etching is called um, Jack and the Geodesic Dome. And I was fascinated to find out that Elaine de Kooning and Buckminster Fuller um, developed a friendship. She was very interested. She uh, went to all his classes. She built, um, worked with the group to make a ge geodesic dome. And in, in this etching, I'm thinking about bringing the um, world of a kind of combining a compilation of um, Black Mountain College and the experience with my personal life and um, my world that surrounds me, my dogs, and also um, this factory, which is right up the street from these, this is um, ruins of a factory. Next, please. So these are later um, dry points. The earlier ones are a little smaller. They're eight by 12. Um, yeah, that's about the size of them. Um, eight by 10, uh, 10 maybe. Um, the larger ones towards the end are, um, are uh, 12 by 16 copper plates. And as I worked um, on the plates and on the subject, I got uh, more interested in the sense of the environment that the dogs were in. Um, and the water, and I think you can see the gestural element. Now, one of the things about working on the dry point that was really kind of amazing, I mentioned that I was really focused on seeing, on seeing um, the structure, on seeing what the dogs were doing, their relationship to each other. Um, the interesting thing was that on the copper, because of the reflective surface of the copper, you, I really could not see my mark. So I was working um, in the dark. I was working blind. And um, I think that allowed me to really focus on seeing. And I think you see a variety of marks here. You see a kind of crisper, softer mark in the, um, uh, in the dogs and then a gestural mark in the, um, the water. And you also see a little bit of sanding that I did on the plate, but basically um, these are one state uh, um, dry points. Next, please. Um, this is another dry point with a kind of composite uh, image, um, views of the dog separately like a sketchbook pad page. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Um, and this um, etching, um, which is smaller, it's eight by 12, um, is kind of a, uh, it's included in the show and it's kind of a, an interesting end page to the series of the, um, of the tug of war because in this scene, the dogs, it's the first time that the dogs aren't fully engaged with each other, but are transfixed by this boat. And I think you, I stepped back and got more of a sense of the um, environment and, um, and the water, it's on the Connecticut River. Um, next, please. This is the, my last image. And um, it shows the way I work with um, etching. Um, this is um, part of the uh, Black Mountain College series, and um, it is an homage to Annie Albert. I was Albers. I was very interested in uh, her as a figure in her work, her weaving, and also in the importance of the weaving studio um, at Black Mountain College. This is made up of three plates. The key plate is the uh, kind of red oxide with the head. And also there's um, a uh, antique device for weaving on, on that plate. Um, there's also, uh, I don't know if you can see, 
there's a kind of dark purple. That was the second plate and it was a soft ground. Um, and um, I pressed string onto it um, and also some screening. And the third plate is the green and it um, was, uh, had the landscape elements of Black Mountain College in it. So um, you can see that that process that I usually work on with the multiple plates is um, uh, the printing is very, it takes a long time. I sometimes vary the, the, uh, the um, uh, what plate is printed first um, and um, it's quite different from the dry points. Now, what I'm hoping, what I wanna take away from the process and discovery show and also my dry points um, is I would like to um, get the immediacy and the kind of drawing in the dark quality and also the variety of mark making into future um, etchings that I do. Uh, thank you. And now I would like to turn over the spotlight to Gail Mooney. Thank you, Rachel. And I just want to echo what uh, Rachel and Greer said that it's really been wonderful being part of this, the process of process <laughs> of discovery, getting to know the other artists um, and also getting to know their work. So the paintings I will be showing you tonight uh, were done on the premises of a 12th, 12th century cathedral in France, the Saint-Denis Basilica, uh, where I've been painting since 1992. Um, and this is a photo of me um, in my element. So um, my work at the Basilica explores the duality between the weight and solidity of stone and the fleeting ephemeral effects of color and light emanating from the stained glass windows and the meaning inherent in uh, the process of transformation that occurs as a result of this uh, light diffused space. My, I approach my work uh, in a similar way to that of a landscape painter, except that uh, the interior of a 12th century cathedral is no ordinary landscape, but a sacred one in which every, every element um, which is to say the sculpture, architecture, stained glass and light all reverberate with symbolic meaning. The soaring arches lead the eye upward seeming to defy gravity while the all pervasive color and light reflecting from stained glass floods the cathedral interior making stone appear to be weightless and transparent. The com combination of these features lifts our gaze upward making us feel as though we're suspended from on high between the earthly and the divine. Next slide, please. So my focus from the start has been on the more than 72 uh, reclining medieval tomb sculptures that are housed in the cathedral interior. The French term for them, gisant, which has no English equivalent, means figure lying down. And in fact, and um, they uh, have been housed in the cathedral since the 13th century when Saint-Denis was declared the official burial place of the French royalty. Now, before I even saw them in person, I saw photos of them and I was struck by their peaceful and blissful demeanors, which seemed so at odds with modern notions of the finality of, of death. As I later learned that this uh, feeling that they exude of of peace and joy was no coincidence because in fact, they were not intended as representations of either the deceased, um, the, dis the person in either death or in their life, but instead are images of the resurrected soul who with eyes open are, um, are seeing paradise for the first time. Um, they were sculpted standing up, so the folds of their clothes do not conform to the weight and gravity of their body, making them appear to be weightless. Observing them bathed in the color and light of the basilica indeed makes them appear to come to life as if illuminated from within. Next slide. So uh, that shows you something, although the color cannot really be 
duplicated in a photo that gives you some idea of the kind of light, uh, what it looks like when they're illuminated by stained glass, the light from the stained glass windows. Next slide. The predominant green gray palette of this painting from uh, 2009. So I'm showing um, pairs of works that um, some are different stages of the same work and some are different paintings, paintings from different period of time. So the first pair is of two different paintings. This one from 2009 conveys the hazy yet luminous quality of light that permeates the cathedral. The experience to me is one of an immersion such as that that I experience when swimming in, in the infinite expanses of the ocean because the light is everywhere all at once. Um, the next slide, please. Um, in this painting from a year later, my focus is on the way the light from the stained glass windows creates a luminous vibration that permeates the entire cathedral, penetrating even the shadows and bathing them in reflected light. People often associate my work with, impression, with uh, you know, impressionism, a comment that makes sense given my interest in light. However, whereas the impressionists were concerned with capturing a fleeting and transitory moment in time, the light of the cathedral is in a perpetual state of transformation and change. And its purpose is, uh, it, it's symbolic and its purpose is to remove the veils from our eyes to participate in, uh, in this uplifting process uh, whereby our gaze is lifted from the earthly to the divine. I would like now uh, like to turn to the three works um, that are in the show and they all, um, so the next slide please. Um, so the, they all focus on heads of, of gisants um, of these statues. And I became interested in, in focusing on heads because observing the uh, gisants close, at close range magnifies the changes in color and light that are occurring moment by moment. In this head, uh, and this, uh, the three are of the same statue of Charlemagne. My focus is um, this paint in this painting from 2010 um, through 2011, that, uh, that's to say I worked on it two different years, is on the monumentality of the head and the effect of light on, on the stone. The next slide, please. In this painting from um, 2018, the, my focus is on these nuanced changes that are occurring moment by moment. And to me, concentrating on the, the shifting color kind of uh, transforms the paint process into a form of meditation um, and contemplation. Next slide, please. Um, now this is two different versions of the same painting. So the one on the left, actually that painting is underneath the painting on the one on the right. And the agitated brush strokes of the one on the left combined with the different color palettes of the two paintings seen side by side, I, um, I think captures something of the feeling of how quickly the light is changing. And my focus on the one on the right, well, on both of them really, is on the seemingly transparency of stone as it is continually dissolved by light uh, and transformed. Um, next slide, please. So now this is a photo of the, um, the next painting I'm gonna show you of Louis the 10th called Le Houtin because of his rebellious and quarrelsome nature. <laughs> um, I, that isn't really the subject of my painting that he's quarrelsome, but I just thought, found that to be interesting. So um, next slide, please. I was drawn to his, well, actually, can you just go back for one minute? I was drawn to his expressive features as well as the way the light illuminated the structure over his head, which doesn't, the colors are not really um, as brilliant in this photo as they are, were at the time when I did um, at least the second painting, which you'll see in a minute. Next slide, please. In this painting from, um, 2009 done on linen, the colors are subdued and in part because of the beige, um, I was working on linen without any ground, meaning without any white or gesso and also perhaps because of the light at the time when it was done, but because it's from, from so many years ago, I 
can't really recall exactly what the light was, but I'm expecting that, well, it's always changing. So it probably was more subdued, at least for part of the time I was working on it. The next slide, please. In this later, this is a later stage of the same painting done 10 years later. Although the painting is more abstract, I feel that it more accurately captures the essence of the ongoing transformation that is occurring continually and through which light itself seems to become a material substance. The painting I feel also uh, captures the way the light is transforming everything in its wake, much like the flickering flashes of light on a river as, as it is carried by the downstream current. So in this ongoing process of transform, it is this, it is this ongoing process of transformation that fascinates me and that propels my process forward. And then um, I just have uh, one other pair of slides to show you. Next slide, please. So, um, and they will be focusing on this gisant of Robert D'Artois. In, um, in a sense, I feel like this brings us full circle as this is the same gisant that I began this evening's talk with, now seen from a frontal perspective, the frontal perspective of this photo. Um, and next slide, please. The two versions I'm gonna show you of this painting were done in a, with a few weeks apart. And this is the first version. Um, so um, after, um, after, and then the next slide, please. After putting the, uh, this is the same painting. Um, and after putting this painting aside um, and storing it for a few weeks, I took, one day I saw this amazing light and I took it out and I was struck by this, the quality of light. And it made me feel, it made me suddenly see the, new, the subject in a new light. I repainted the painting um, from start to finish. Usually when I rework paintings, the changes I make are more incremental, but here I repainted the entire painting in one, se in one session. The experience was freeing and exhilarating, making me feel for those few brief moments that I was completely at one with my subject. So that's the end of my talk. And I would now like to introduce Kamini Avril. Hey, greetings to everybody. Thank you, Gail. Thank you to all who've come. Um, I'm Kamini Avril, and um, I don't know why I found it really difficult to put my thoughts in a concise uh, form. I wrote down some things, and I don't like reading, but um, I think I'm going to do that. Um, I'm also, I realize that I'm not directly talking about the specific images that you'll be seeing. So if any questions that you have about that, I can easily take later. Um, this was approximately 35 by 43 inches. Uh, the other drawings that you'll see are, uh, are three quarters that size. Um, the two paintings are, uh, four foot by five feet, uh, the largest, the first, and the, the last is slightly smaller than that. So where does an image come from? How is imagination triggered? Can I spark this process? And can I find what tells me something I don't know? Uh, thinking about these questions, the South Asian myth of the churning of the milky ocean came to mind. The still cosmic waters lay undisturbed. Within them are countless wonders, as well as the nectar of immortality. But these can only be brought to the surface by churning the ocean. Using the world mountain as the post and the king of serpents as the rope wrapped around it, the gods holding its tail and the demons grabbing its head, the waters are violently churned. The story here, the story, this myth is a very long, very elaborate, very rich in symbols. Uh, I 
would love to tell you the whole thing, but I only mentioned this part of it here in relation to the necessity that I feel of agitating what often feels like a frozen ocean of impenetrable depth. The only thing, oh, next slide, please. The only thing that occurs to me at these times when I don't seem to be able to access anything that pulls me forward to, uh, to work, but just a sense of my love of, of painting, of drawing, and, um, and that's so vague, feels so vague. The only thing I know to do is to try to make a connection with the primal energy, both internal and Eastern terms, the chi or the prana and external energy, moving, literally moving things around. Next slide, please. Holding onto a stick of charcoal, a rag, a palette knife, a paint stick or, or a brush and pressing against the surface seems to allow a continuous flow of energy from the body's core up through the arm, into the hands, and through the fingers. The marks and the full body swipes come from that core. This is, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I think I, I, think I need the, the next slide, please. Thanks. This is like, to me, this is like gripping onto the serpent who is wrapped around the mountain. The mountain being all that encompasses the events and relationships in one's life from the past into the present. And the serpent, which is the primal energy, which is, which is churning all of these memories uh, from the unconscious which is bringing up through the uh, through the act through this ocean onto to the surface. Um, so these I will I'll take a moment and and I'll speak directly to this image. Um, the when I when I end up seeing an image, it uh, often startles me, and it was nothing I had in mind. Um, for instance, I was working with a figure of some sort. And, um, and then went into it without really seeing, without using my, vis my physical eyes and, um, and stepped back and noticed the, the tiger. I did very, very little at, uh, from that point on to just to clarify that. Um, next slide, please. I've been well, the, referring to the drawings, I've been stretching paper onto a hard surface and priming it so I can use oil as well as water as a medium. This gives a very uncontrollable situation like the previous one. Uh, things uh, slip around and, um, and it's very easy to wipe and scrape off. So I can repeatedly um, obliterate what I have um, until until something happens through the through the traces of what's what remains that reminds me of an image that I want to pursue further. Um, and it has to strike at a at a deep, it has to strike at an emotional level. So this is um, it this is a, the larger of the two paintings. And I see it as a tree, as a frozen tree. Um, and this is, um, so this is oil on canvas, but with really the, a very similar process, it's just thicker. I'm learning to, what I'm learning to do at this point is also to try to respect the process and, and do much less once I get to that point of recognizing, because I find that overdefining um, as I'm trying to search for the image, um, I can really overdefine it, and I'm trying, and I'm I'm respecting more 
this place where it's implied, where it is just coming out and is just enough to be clear in the sense of expression and gesture. Next slide, please. The, uh, I, oh, I wanted to, to mention, um, I, I'm, uh, um, works that are very, have been very inspirational have been uh, Goya's small two inch um, paintings on ivory, which um, he did late in his life. And it's described that he, he spread them with a wetened graphite and then he dropped, dro well, drops of, of water. And what he would see in the blurry mass, he would then uh, define. And um, with also with a variety of, of wonderful brush strokes and washes, um, I find his work to be very uh, timeless um, and very, very fresh to this day. Uh, I'm also learning to trust the process of not knowing, uh, which used to make me feel extremely anxious. And um, because it can take time, it can take um, weeks. Um, but what I'm learning is that the more open I become uh, and the more uh, relaxed that something does eventually come through. Um, this is called Carried Away. And um, I painted it, uh, right before we all heard about COVID. Um, so, it, which, but it spoke to me of, um, it spoke to me a lot of, of, of grief, but also not just of a beautiful state somehow. I'm not always sure. Um, I, I can't just necessarily describe um, what, the, what they are. Uh, but I'd like to leave you with um, a quote I recently came upon by Kafka. You do not need to leave your room. Remain sitting at your table and listen. Do not even listen. Simply wait. Be still and solitary. The world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Thanks. So we're now going to open things up for questions, which you can raise your hand. And uh, Trisha Vita, our gallery um, assistant, who uh, we would not function at all with without, <laughs> who's essential to everything we do, uh, she's going to be fielding the questions. So take it away, Trisha. Okay, so um, if anyone has any questions, you can either put them in chat or you can just raise your hand um, and unmute yourself and ask your question. Who has the first question? I'm gonna go to, we have three screens. Um, let's see. Okay, Anne asks if you can scroll through the images again. Can we do that while we're doing the questions? Fine with me. Yeah, and if you have a question, I mean, there's three screens. Um, you can also put it in chat and um, then actually ask it live, just so you know. I'll see that. Um, there were some questions in the. Um, Let's see, someone asked um, Rachel, are the sanded parts the blurry areas? Um, let's see, are the sanded parts the blurry areas of tone? Uh, yes, and um, it's something that I did in the later ones, not in the earlier ones. So um, you see a kind of softness. Sometimes I draw over it. So 
over the image so you might not see the sanded parts. Like if we stop right here, um, right above the dogs on the left, that's a sanded part. I, can, I don't know if that answers the question. Well, well, how you achieve that tone, it's, it's the uh, rough the plate. Uh, yeah, it's just um, when I wanted to soften something that was drawn there, Okay. Um, it, it's like a way of erasing a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but it's very interesting because the dry point, you know, it looks like so dark and gutsy. It looks like the the edge of the the water is like really incised in the plate, but actually, when you go to to print it, um, you realize that the first and second prints are sometimes the best you're going to get, and then it starts to the dry point will break down. Um, because it's a, it's that metal burr, you know, that you get that yeah. touches the the ink. Right. You, so you only get so many prints out right, of it. Right. Yeah. Right. As as Petterdy described it, it's the it's like the plow, the furrow, um, is that. So a uh, Grant Drumheller has a question to everyone. Um, how do the participating artists decide when an image is completed or finished? I was interested in the differences between the sketch versions or earlier versions and the final versions. Okay. Who wants the answer that? <laughs> Maybe we should go in order. So the Tony, do you want to go first? Okay. Um... Uh, as I said, I mean, there was one particular painting where I, I made a point of saying that it was finished. You know, I mean, I really felt that this, that, yeah, that one, um, we just went by. Um, but, you know, I guess it's always a, the, the, the thing of where um, you feel like you, you've said something and and if you keep working on it, either you're going to say something else, change the conversation, which I, I think has to happen, or or you're just going to water down what you've already said. So, um, and it and it, and I'm not saying that I'm I'm always on track with this, but um, but it but it it's you know it's something that you, you need to. In, I mean, it's something you all try to pay attention to. Um, but um, my way of, I mean, except I'm working on, except I'm working on a longer term painting, I always have to find ways of getting back into the painting. Um, so there, and, and it may mean making a change or, you know, doing something else. So um, something different or, or maybe a different angle or whatever. But um, that's, just the way I, I found uh, that was helpful for me in, in working out my paintings. Um, other than that, with like sort of like the watercolor we're looking at now, it's really about a f kind of trying to get a freshness, trying to get immediacy. And it's one of the reasons why I concentrated on watercolor, um, this, especially this past, um, it's been over the years, but especially this past summer. Um, trying to uh you know to have it teach me something about that so greer do you have a this is the most recent one so I guess I would answer this um, by saying that uh, the version on the right, which is the, the finished version, is finished because I spent enough days with it after I last painted on it that it was no longer bothering me. <laughs> or there's something about it that seemed to, to want to change. Mm.
Rachel, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, well, I, I think the question is a great question. Um, it's not uh, that uh, connected to the dry points that I'm showing because um, they are immediate. It's a different process for me, you know? So um, I mentioned that um, I found that um, I printed it and I didn't want to rework it, which um, is a in completely different from the way that I work, you know. Um, and the surprise was very great because as I was working on it, I really couldn't see what it looked like. So, so I think that gets to the point that um, so much of the time I'm looking at something and I'm, you know, it, it's like I'm in it. I'm in the painting, I'm in the etching, and um, you know, it's a process of, I need to move this over here, or I need to darken this over here. And then you get to a point where it's like your energy is spent. Although I think, I, I know there's a story um, about Degas that people would like not like to have him come over at their house uh, if they had some of his owned a painting of his because he would always want to borrow it back and work on it. <laughs> so, but I understand what Greer is saying, you know, you get to a point and uh, sometimes you have to take, turn the painting to the wall, not look at it or the, the print, put it away and then you, you have a fresh start. But a lot of times you're just not, you get to a point where you have nothing more to say about it. You can't make it better, you know, or and you're no longer in it. So, but I, I think that the, um, the dry points for me were just a different process completely. I guess for me, the, the idea of finish and unfinish is just so central to my work. And because I'm really interested in sort of this trans idea of transformation and where it's going to take me. And so I'm trying to remain open to seeing things in a new light. But, um, you know, so it's a very, I struggle a lot with the decision of whether to continue working on a painting. I think I've ruined a lot of paintings because I'll just be struck by the light on a particular day and I just don't want to stop working, you know, and I'll just keep working. And it, I have a hard time when I'm in the cathedral because I don't have a studio there. And it's sometimes hard to get the distance from my work that, to really see what's going on. Although um, usually I'm there for three months and then I'm away for nine months. And when I go back, of course, then by then, you know, I'm seeing things differently. So it's just an ongoing struggle for me um, to know when a pain, when I'm kind of not gonna work on a painting anymore. And um, I think it's an act of discernment and I struggle with that a lot. And um, other than that, I would just say, um, the only gauge I have is can I live with it the way it is? Because um, often like in this painting you're seeing right now, there are parts of the, uh, it, it's painted on linen and there are parts of the linen showing through but in this particular painting, I know I just reached a point where I was like, I, I'm just gonna leave it as is. And so I have some paintings that are, um, you know, where the paint is more built up and others that, you know, maybe look unfinished, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna work on them anymore. So it's really just an open question for me. And, you know, I, I like thinking about it and I feel it's, I feel that whole question has a lot of um, meaning and so I struggle with it. We have uh, three more questions. Um, let's see, there's a question from Matthew Lopez who's asking, what's more important, process or result? Who would like to answer from, from the panelists? I'll answer in one word, process. For me, um, I completely, I'm, I'm completely, um, that's what drives me is the process and um, maybe to a fault sometimes, because as I said, sometimes I don't know how to feel like I know how to finish a painting and, 
but I, I just love the process and because I find it, it's, uh, well, you know, I find I equate it with learning. And so I feel there's always something new to learn. And so, you know, that's what, that's what really drives me is, is that process of what, you know, what else can I learn from this experience? So I have a much harder time with deciding something uh, with the result because I rarely am happy with the result. So there's a question for uh, Kamini. Uh, it's from Colleen Franca. Um, she asks, you said, you're, you said you work until you feel something emerges for you. Does that mean it has to be something figurative or do you ever arrive at an image that is abstract and that is what resonates? And that's a good question. Um, and it's one I ask myself <laughs> all the time because I'm constantly questioning um, what I'm, this uh, set restless sense of, of looking for, like what, what is one looking for? Um, and all I know is that that point when, uh, what is really very abstract up to the, this point, kind of coalesces into a forms in space may not be a figure or it could be an animal or bird or landscape element or element of at the atmosphere. But when it coalesces into something, um, I have a palpable sense of a, of a world that, um, that I can enter. And um, with all of the, um, well, almost like a almost like a story or a, or a narrative that doesn't progress in time, that just stays still, um, and the, and I have such a greater sense of rapport with it, um, and that connection I think is the thing that that I really pulls me in. So I think that the figurative or or coalescing into a kind of world. Uh, with elements that I know from this world, I think that is important and I don't think I would or could leave it as, um, as an abstract, you know, completely abstract painting. Uh, Kamini, someone else also uh, mentioned, Jan Freeman said, Kamini didn't speak about knowing when a painting is finished. Oh. Uh huh. Um, well, and about this, the, and also with the aspect of the sketches, um, mm -hmm. with, um, I don't usually do, I don't, I haven't for a long time, years, done like a sketch and then a painting from a sketch. The sketches kind of, as it were, are all part, are all underneath the final thing. Um, and, um, and how I know when something is done, um, there's a couple of different ways that that can go. One is, is I might just stop. I might just stop working and um, I just stop. I don't know what makes me stop. Um, and uh, another way is, is it has a, a rightness on a formal value, a formal as level. Um, it has a kind of balance, uh, a kind of um, knitted togetherness. And um, uh, and 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 then not, and then I like the, the what was said about um, if you don't feel like you need to keep working on it, that's another way too. Thank you, Kamini. Uh, we have a question from Petey Brown for Greer. Uh, Petey asks, "Do you know at the beginning that what, that you will be whittling away many of the images?" I don't really know anything at the beginning, and <laughs> the whole thing is to know something. I mean, I, every painting seems different. Uh, it often happen that, ha happens that I do whittle away images, um, but I, I don't have a pattern or an expectation, really. It's a mystery, and that's, what, that's what's so exciting, isn't it? And it's kind of fun to discover something. Thank you. Um, 
Let's see. Um, Gail, Barbara Grossman asks, what are the sizes of your paintings, especially the heads? Well, the three that are in the show are, I don't have the exact sizes right off the top of my head, but they are, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the sizes right off the top of my head, but um, gosh, I want to say, uh, I'm just guessing really, maybe 15 by 20. And then the next, the next head that I had the two different versions of is quite a bit bigger. And I would like to do large heads. Uh, the problem is, you know, this is a major tourist <laughs> uh, place and I'm blocking people's view, um, setting up my easel literally right in front of the statue. So it does limit, um, you know, how large I can work. I mean, if, if it really, you know, if I had the whole place to myself, I, I'd work big, but it's really not possible to work that big when you're in a public, I mean, it's, it's, it's a museum. Do you work away from the subject as well? No, no, not, I mean, I do other things besides the, this, but when I'm, no, I work only, I, I only work there because, um, because my, my, really my subject matter is the way the light is continually um, changing and transforming and, um, and, you know, my goal really is just to immerse myself in the experience of being there and see what comes out of it. So, um, you know, not that there wouldn't be things to learn, um, you know, maybe working in a studio, but at the moment, I mean, that's my focus is, is the experience itself. So that's at least for these works. I think if, you know, I'd be more inclined to do other subjects um, in the studio because I guess I'm really interested in just where the experience is going to take me. So I don't really want to come in with any kind of pre preconceived idea of what it is I'm after. Oh. Thank you. That's fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Um, C.M. Grund has a question. You can unmute yourself and ask it. Go ahead. I'll, I'll unmute. Oh, thank, thank you. Very, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Um, do you find that the context provided by your life in other respects heavily influences your work? Or do you enter into a special realm when you work on a painting? And this is directed to anyone who feels like they would like to answer. Well, thanks, Cynthia. Nice to see you, by the way. Good to see you, Tony. <laughs> it's been decades. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> well, I, I would say, it, it, for me, it is a special realm, and uh, it's not, I don't always feel like I attain that, you know, when I'm painting. I think um, it's something I just, you know, once you've felt that, you know, it's something that you strive. I don't know if you really can bring it on, you know, willfully, but it's just something that happens as you're working. Um, you know, this, you know, when we're teachers uh, Lester Johnson used to say about you know being an artist for you know you know there's you have certain you know practical things that you do you're crossing the street you know you're watching what's going on but you're painting and it's like he said you want to be a little off <laughs> so I think what he meant by that it was, it was like I mean you're not you know in the practical world of you know of this or that and you know, and, and then where I paint, it's, it, it can be very noisy. There's people out there, the music could be blaring. And then I, I find that sometimes um, when I get to that point, if the, it, it kind of all kind of starts to fade away. It seems very distant and I'm just painting out there. So um, I, I don't know. I just speak from my own experience. <laughs> okay. Yes. Do we have any more questions, live questions? You can, oh, go ahead, Rachel. Um, I, I had a question for Kamini um, and um, I, I'm very interested in her process um, because um, it seems very physical and it seems, um, I guess, most connected 
to um, abstract expressionism mm -hmm. in terms of um, the painting, the connection between the painter and the painting of having it emerge. And I know in our rehearsal conversation, we were talking about how it was kind of like a sculptor finding the, um, the subject in, in as you're chiseling uh, away stone. And I just wondered if you could talk about that and the, the subconscious, the way ideas kind of present themselves to you in the process. Of working mm -hmm. yeah um that's a good question and it is it does often feel like um like being us like making it and i and especially with well not just with the drawing anymore also with painting i'm really just throwing myself into it like both hands at time in a very uh, in a very abstract expressionist kind of physical way um, uh, that's what I was talking about was how images, how the imagination does get activated because until it's really flowing, um, I, there's still this distance and I rely upon that method to, um, of physicality and of whatever is inside of visual memory and, um, uh, the unconscious that's stored in the body. I rely upon that to bring out just by happenstance um, images that I will see and recognize that will, that will propel me further. Uh, when things are flowing, uh, then there can be more of this sense of the material actually making the images as, and the synchronicity with forms or spaces or, or the thing itself coming at that moment that you're up there doing it. And those times I kind of like live for those times because that's such a, a, a like kind of a magical feeling. Um, like this hand, like the hand, the white hand in the drawing that's up that was kind of, that was like one of those moments um, that it was, I both recognized it as a hand or I suppose as a potential hand and then made the marks that made it the hand. Um, the face was, was one of those times that I was talking about the back and forth of just moving very physically, maybe wiping it out, doing something again, wiping it, stepping back, and I see a face. I didn't make that face. I only like maybe I darkened something around one of the eyes to and then the, maybe I darkened a little in some of the features just to bring it out. It's also my brother who passed away a couple of years ago. And I find that unconsciously images of him will come out like that. So I think it's is I have a, a more and more a deep respect for the unconscious and for processes that um, that circumvent um, knowing and even you, you know. But anyway, that's to answer your question. Thank you. Oh, Colleen just uh, typed in an interesting comment uh, on that. She said, Kamini's process reminds me of a video I saw recently of Milton Resnick working. He kept wiping out what he had, and then other forms were re-emerging. The painting changes about 15 times in a 30-minute span. Fascinating. It seems to, it seems it relied on intuition and vision. Does anyone, um, if anyone has any other questions they would like to ask live, you can unmute yourself and do that because we have three pages of guests. So it's, it's sometimes hard to see a raised hand with the screen sharing. So if you have a question, um, let's go ahead. Cynthia has one, or was that a, Right. Your name's Cynthia, right? 
Yes, um, I'm sorry, that was my, my previous question. Oh, okay, okay, I just saw a hand there, so. But I, I'm interested in, in, in what the, the rest of the artists would have to say as an answer to my question. Um, I'm the one who asked, let's see if I can scroll back to uh, where I had it in the chat here. Um, do you find that the context provided by your life in other respects heavily influences your work or do you enter into a special realm when you work on a painting? Well, could you, could you please repeat the first part of that? Yeah. Do you find that the context provided by your life in other respects heavily influences your work uh, or do you enter into a special realm when you work on a painting? Uh, for for me, um, I find that um, very much uh, my life autobiography um, begins the process and then um, visual observation um, and uh, stimulates it, you know, be a walk. I mean, recently, um, you know, with all the snow and the sunlight and shadows, you know, um, presented all kinds of opportunities for mm -hmm. me um, to think about new things, visual uh, stimulus. Um, but um, the, I, I think I, a lot of what um, inspires me is autobiography, you know, i.e. my dogs and, and, um, I'm actually working on an, a new series, um, uh, Black Mountain College series um, continues my interest in um, artist communities, what artists say to each other, how they inspire each other. Uh, my last show at the Bowery Gallery was about um, the um, happenings in New York in the early 60s. And um, I would say that's a direct connection to my own background, which um, I come from an artistic family. And my new work is actually very much uh, connected to my life. Um, uh, my father was a, a WPA muralist and uh, he was included in the, sh in the exhibition at the, the Whitney um, Vida Americana about the influence of Mexican painting on, um, uh, on American artists. And um, right before I knew that my father was gonna be in the show, his name was, is Mitchell Saporin. Um, before I knew he was gonna be included in the show, I started wondering, I knew he had um, traveled to Mexico a couple of times with a group of friends to see the murals because for him that was more exciting than um, than Paris, what was going on in Paris, you know? And so I asked my sister who lives in the house that um, we grew up in, if there were any photographs from the trips. And um, after all these years uh, of these negatives being on the third floor of the house and before that surviving um, my father's World War II experience, um, she, came, she found these negatives which um, were developed and uh, they are so inspiring. So for me, um, the idea of autobiography um, is so important as the kind of impetus of what gets me started on, on work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do any of the other artists? Oh, um, I, I would say that that for me, it's that as much as like I might do um, studies of um, things, landscapes or portraits. When I'm in there in my studio, it's a not it's its own world. Mm -hmm. Probably opposite from Rachel. And of course, all those things come in, but they come in through the back door. Thank you. 
I would just say that I bring all my life's experiences to my work, but yet what I really am seeking, whether painting a landscape or painting in the cathedral, is to be transported by the experience and to, um, you know, it's not something that can be forced. I mean, it's really an experience of letting go and giving yourself over to the experience um, of the gift of, you know, both the creative process, which is a gift, but also of what I'm experiencing mm -hmm. or my eyes and to just sort of forget who I am and where I am and let something else take over. Well, thank you. Greer or Kennedy? I would agree with what Rachel was saying about context and, and, um, and then Tony and Gail talking about once you're in the process, um, sort of transcendent experience. And for me, uh, the keeping of a journal is the start of that special place. It sort of is a thread that runs through my life, that context. And also just setting up my palette each day, for me, is very meditative. It's like tuning an instrument. And I, I find that starts to bring me to that place. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, Colleen uh, is asking, is your father's work documented? Can we see it? Maybe yes. where can we see it? It, my father's work is uh, very well documented. Um, his frescoes uh, in post offices can be seen. He did the St. Louis post office um, in, uh, and he did the Decatur, Illinois frescoes in the post office. Um, those were in the 30s. The, the, the St. Louis post office was finished in 1941 and then he um, became a war artist in the Second World War and was in Italy and North Africa. He's in many collections. Um, he's, if, if you ha, um, have access to the catalog of the, um, the exhibition, um, uh, v, uh, Vita Americana uh, from um, uh, the Whitney, the recent exhibition, his he has um, his three works that are in the show are in the catalog. If you type in Mitchell Saporin, um, oh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Greer just held up the book. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's in it. <laughs> um, he, he's in a lot of collections. Um, he has got a beautiful painting in the Whitney um, in their collection. Um, which is from my favorite period of his work, which is the late 40s. Um, it's a painting about uh, called Dancers by the Clock, and it's about um, uh, Times Square, a la 1948, when it was painted with people dancing, and it's kind of metaphoric in terms of time. You know, so he's he he could be. There's lots of images of his work. Rachel, I remember uh, one time you and your sons took a road trip to see his work because I, re I recall you posted these beautiful photos on Facebook. Um, my, my son, Michael, who's, who's an artist and a printmaker and an animator who is really responsible for getting me back into printmaking, um, uh, he was um, actually doing a... Uh, um, uh, he was a visiting artist at Knox College, where um, well, he was he was a uh, with I'm sorry I'm uh, at Knox College, and while he was there, we went we met in Chicago, and we went on the Mitchell Saporin, um, what we call the Mitchell Saporin um, mural tour of the Midwest, and we. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, the the frescoes at Lane Technical High School, and then we went to Decatur. We did it um, in terms of a time frame. The uh, the murals at, at Lane Technical High School. There's many many murals at, at that high school. Um, they were all frescoes. Uh, that was the first one. He was 26 at the time, and then we went to Decatur, Illinois, um, which was finished in 38, and then we went we ended up in St. Louis. 
Sounds amazing. Yeah, it was great. I mean, all these years I'd seen reproductions of his work, but I had never, um, I, I had never seen the actual work. Mm -hmm. So it was really exciting. And it was exciting to see um, it with, with Michael, my son. So there's many wonderful comments in the, um, in the chat. Um, you know, you, everyone can save the chat and read it. And uh, we will also, does anyone else have any live questions they'd like to ask? Just unmute yourself and ask away. I guess not. Um, so I have one. Oh, you have one? Okay, go ahead. Um, this is for Rachel. So you mentioned the the happenings um, as a um, like it was your history. Or, I was wondering about you know your relationship with the early happenings in New York. Well, actually, the happenings were not um, part of my experience. Um, I just a lot of the artists that were involved in the happenings. Um, are artists who I am very drawn to, like Red Grooms, um, uh, Jim Dine, um, uh, and, and also Bob Thompson, who's an artist I love, um, was also involved in the in the um, in the happenings, and I just got really intrigued by, I guess, the period because. Um, I was too young for it to attend the happenings and it wasn't, um, you know, my, my father's experience that was later. Um, but I just found the sense of, well, I guess the old, um, the, the photographs of um, what New York was like and the kind of spontaneity of um, the events um, and the relationship of the audience and the participants, you know, where you don't know if the audience are really part of the, the performance or not. I was just very intrigued by, uh, again, the kind of relationship of the artists to each other. And um, hey, that's what the Bowery Gallery is all about too. <laughs> my, my father was in some of the happenings with Red and Bob. And so Jay Milder is famous. So that was fun to hear. Oh, met. I've met you. Oh, hello. <laughs> Did I meet you at um at CCSU or no? No. I don't think so. I don't oh, know. Okay. So who was your father? He is uh Jay uh, Milder. Excuse me? Jay Milder. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, so I was just curious. Oh, yeah, so um, wh which, what performances was he in? Oh, he was in uh, The Burning Building with Red Grooms. Um, that was really early. Yeah, yeah, they were like the first people who did them. Was yeah. he in that Hans Hoffman school? Yes. Because that happened in Provincetown. Yeah, he was in Provincetown. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Anyway, wow. Yeah. I'm going to go look at the, the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. It was great. Thank, thank you. So um, do, um, do any of the panelists have any other comments or questions they'd like to bring up? Or any of the guests? Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming this evening. And um, it's... Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation with all of you. And, and uh, if you're not on the mailing list of the Bowery Gallery and would like to be, well, let us know. You can um, you know, follow what all of us are doing and the other artists in the gallery. And um, there'll be more events like this one. So I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I want to do the same. Thank you all for attending. It's been a wonderful experience. Good to see you. All of you. <laughs> Hopefully, you. see you in person, not in the not too distant future. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere, somewhere down the road. Right. Thank you so much. It's been a nice uh, process and a nice uh, product as well. Okay.
Okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> 